Event recording is in progress. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, and uh, welcome to to introduction to CAD. Uh, actually, this is most uh, the schedule said this was for FTC. I think that I failed to uh, realize that I need to remove FRC from there. Um, uh, so I'm I'm uh, Curtis Bolin. I'm a research scientist with Honeywell Quantum Systems, uh, and uh, I work mainly on ion trap on computers. Um, I've been a coach of an FTC team for six years, and this is my first year not coaching anymore. Uh, and I'm with uh, the uh, steering committee, um, and I have a co-presenter that I will I'll let him introduce himself. Okay, my name is Grant Terry, and I'm with eRobotics Carbon Fiber uh, 7373, and I do a lot of work with CAD on that team, and yeah. All right. And what he didn't mention was that they qualified for Worlds, what, twice last year? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we qualified twice, and we won the Inspire Award and yeah. Robot Game last year. So, <laughs> so yeah, so they're, they're, a, they're a very accomplished team, and I, I've been impressed with their CAD program, and, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to have Grant along. If people have questions in particular about, you know, how teams are incorporating CAD, I think I think uh, the team has a lot of experience in this area, and, and he's going to have a lot of answers. So I'm going to advance the slide by one. Uh, so, so uh, why am I why am I giving this class? So first, uh, while I have very strong opinions about which CAD software to use, I'm not going to tell you which one to use. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, or we, I should say, are not going to sit here for an hour and just show you how to use a piece of CAD software. Uh, there are a few slides that that give you a sense of of uh, what you're getting into when you when you use CAD software, but but you're, you're obviously not going to learn this by sitting and watching somebody move a mouse around on the screen for an hour. Uh, rather, I want to, you know, it's an intro to CAD team, to, of course, so I'm hoping that you, you know, that people who are, are advanced users of CAD aren't logging into this and saying, what's it got for me? Uh, this is much more of a, of a script about how a team that is not incorporating CAD into their program or is at the very beginning of it can, uh, can gain the tools they need to start incorporating CAD into their program. Uh, so first I'm going to talk for a while about uh, how CAD works and what it is, and, and then we're going to have a few slides that discuss, it, once you've started designing things, uh, uh, ways you can make them, and then we have some project examples at the end. Uh, as time permits, we can go through some things that that we've seen over the years and that our teams have done themselves uh, as examples. Um, but uh, you know, this is sort of the what, why, and how question for CAD as opposed to just teaching you how to use a CAD program. So uh, yeah, I can advance. So this picture over on the right is a, is a, um, a, a mechanical drawing of a system that comes from my work. It's actually in a publication that, that uh, I'm an author on. Uh, and and I think it's it's quite uh, illustrative of uh, of why we use CAD, right? We want to design, we want to draw things uh, in order to design and prototype them, uh, and we can also use these models as numerical as inputs to numerical simulations, all sorts of things from electromagnetic to mechanical, uh, fluid dynamics, aerodynamics, thermal. Uh, and then I'm, a, I'm actually an optical engineer by trade, so, so I actually use optical CAD programs. Um, but you can see a very complex assembly here with lots of parts uh, that have to fit in. What's not shown is this very tiny chamber these have to fit into extremely precisely. Uh, and and a, a man named Jason Amini uh, drew all this up uh, as, a, as a prototyping mechanism and actually printed it out in 3D. And, and put it all together uh, with the 3D printed parts just to figure out if there were any gotchas along the way uh, that were going to keep us from being able to assemble the final thing because the final parts when they were made cost uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars actually. Uh, and, and after doing that is not the point where you want to figure out that you've done something horribly wrong uh, and that none of it works. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so there's there's a couple of different types of CAD programs. So the the first one is is explicit, and I think uh, it's a picture of a potter, potting wheel, but but it's essentially like working with clay, right? When you want to add 
a chunk to your model. Uh, you just take a glob and you stick it on there and you shape it, uh, and then you move on, right? You can't you can't go back and revise later on uh, one of the dimensions of the lump you added on. Uh, you can just cut it back off or add something on top of it, um, but it has no memory of the process that went into the components that add up to the whole. Uh, parametric is is a design tree. It's a it's basically a list of vertices, a list of curves, a list of surfaces, a list of bodies, uh, and you can go back through this gigantic tree of, of pieces that went into your model and change a single dimension at any point you want, and it'll propagate all the way up through the model to the top. Uh, so that's what you call a parametric CAD program. And the, the explicit ones are, are really, uh, you might have encountered them if your school had like a 3D printer program or something like that, and you and you sat there at a computer for an hour and drew something, and then they printed on the 3D printer. Very basic kind of software, uh, not really um, uh, the kind of thing that's extensible to the sorts of projects like you saw on the previous page, uh, or even even robotics, right? You, you're gonna you're gonna want to be able to say way down the line, well, what if I take out this part, or what if a manufacturer changes a part? by a tiny amount uh, and I need to fit it into my system. I don't want to have to start from scratch and build the entire thing again uh, each time that happens. And parametric lets you do that. Uh, so I'm going to go, oh, OK. Uh, so let's talk about what kind of CAD programs there are out there. Um, so SolidWorks is a vendor of CAD programs, and I believe that that's what Grant uses, if you can confirm that. Uh, we, we mainly use SolidWorks and Inventor, yeah. OK. Uh, Inventor is another um, professional uh, application. Um, I used Inventor up until I changed employers about a year ago, and now I use SolidWorks. Uh, Autodesk is the, is the vendor for the Inventor program. They also make a program called AutoCAD that I think is a little bit dated. Uh, and then they make a program called Fusion 360, which is their, their sort of um, newest uh, product uh, that they're, it's not fully capable yet, but it's pretty close. Uh, so they make three separate CAD products. Um, Fusion 360 is actually heavily adopted by essentially like the maker community because it's because it's one you can buy. You can basically rent it by the month for for really cheap, uh, as compared to the others. Right? My my employer pays thousands of dollars a year for me to be able to use SolidWorks. TTC Creo is a highly specialized uh, professional program. Uh, it, uh, so my employer Honeywell also uses PTC Creo, the, the uh, mechanical group uses it. I think it costs like $20,000 a year per person or something like that. Uh, it is really a top end code that you're not likely to encounter unless you get into, uh, into a setting where it's, where it's your job to draw things. Um, there are hundreds of other CAD programs out there from SketchUp, IronCAD, OnShape. I think somebody else is giving an OnShape tutorial here. There's hundreds of others. There's one called FreeCAD, which is obviously free. Uh, the, the closest I will come to rec making a recommendation here is to say that the professional grade tools I talked about, SolidWorks, Autodesk, and Creo, are absolutely free for FTC and FRC students and also their mentors. Uh, and that is true as long as you are a student and using it for educational purposes, uh, that those programs are all just given away for free. You just go to the website, click your student, and they will allow you to download it. I think some of them actually have a uh, pull down that says, I'm an FTC student or I'm an FTC coach uh, or you know, with FIRST. I don't know if it's FTC specific. And they will allow you to download and license these, these programs that cost thousands of dollars. Uh, so I don't really understand why you would use a different code. Uh, uh, because there's there's nothing about them that makes them intrinsically more difficult to use. Uh, they just they have a lot more capability, I think, than the others, and are much more sophisticated. And, they, and they're they're what you will wind up using if you go to college or graduate school or become a professional. So I think it's a good start where you can. There are other useful design tools besides these CAD programs. Uh, Inkscape is a 2D vector drawing program uh, that you can use for graphics. Uh, or for uh, laser cutting and so on. Uh, the only other thing I will say is if you're if you have a Mac, if you're stuck with a Mac computer in your robotics program uh, or a iOS uh, device, Fusion 360 is the only program on this page uh, 
uh, that will work that I that I am certain will work. Uh, and it's because it's a browser-based interface. Uh, so Fusion 360 is your is your way to go if you're on iOS. Uh, go ahead and advance. Okay. Uh, so if you have picked a CAD program, uh, the first question you might ask is, well, how do I learn how to do this? Uh, and um, the, the the thing that I use, and I think I will recommend to anybody who can get access to it, is is a website called Lynda.com. So they make very high-end professional training videos uh, that you follow along uh, on your TV or on your computer. Uh, they cost a lot of money, uh, but again, uh, I know in Cobb County, uh, Georgia, the library gives you free access. I think that's probably true of a lot of library systems. Uh, and then also you can start to stream them just on any smart TV. Uh, and actually, I don't think I ever got past the part that you can just stream on your TV, they give you some number of hours, uh, or at least they did uh, many years ago. They give you some number of hours before you uh, have to, to log into an account. Um, so any smart TV, you just get the Linda app uh, and you find your course. They have training courses uh, that, that span tens of hours uh, for every single professional code that I mentioned on the previous page, uh, Fusion 360 included. Um, the, the next step is that the software vendors themselves have extensive documentation on their websites and they have a lot of videos uh, about how to, um, to to use these codes. I'm not sure the, is the animation, there was an animation in this slide, but I'm not sure it's working. Um, I don't think the animation works because we're sharing the file through the WebEx. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a bummer. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I think this was the one place where I had an animation. Uh, so you're not seeing all the pictures that were embedded over there um, that had like more information, but uh, the the vendor sites are very, very useful. Uh, and they're definitely, if you need to perform a certain function or you need to figure out what something does going to their website and, and using their, their resources is very useful. Um, YouTube uh, is, is not a complete and total wasteland there. It, oftentimes when I want to learn how to do a particular thing in a CAD program, I'll just go type it into Google. And it invariably will take me to a YouTube video uh, where somebody is showing me how to do it. Most of the time, they're pretty good. Sometimes they're really, really bad. Um, so, you know, you, you all are familiar with YouTube. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, neglect uh, the option of, of getting a book. So you can buy both, all kinds of books on these professional codes that, that teach you how to do things. Uh, they're not free. They cost money. Uh, but you when you're following the videos, you just find yourself constantly pausing and rewinding, and, and, and uh, you do not have to do that with a book. Uh, so, um, okay, so the next slide is, is really telling teams what, you know, how do you start doing CAD and how do you advance through CAD to, through multiple, you know, layers to, to having a program that's fully integrated with CAD tools. Uh, this is, you know, I would say that, that uh, when I was started coaching my team six years ago, we were basically doing nothing with CAD. Uh, and by a couple of years ago, we were actually doing uh, basically the first four of these things. It took many years to get through some of these steps, right? Of just getting the students to learn how to use the CAD program uh, up through this full progression. So the first thing is, is simply learning how to CAD. and uh, I will keep telling you about the notebook, uh, and, and you probably heard other talks today about the notebook, but just documenting the process of learning how to CAD is something that goes into your notebook and can really add some, some heft to your notebook, right? If you sit there and watch videos uh, and sit there with a program and produce something, write a notebook entry, right? Put a picture of what you learned, of what you made, and a statement about what you learned, and, and move on. You can add some real heft to your notebook that way. Uh, the earliest thing my team did was just taking the robot as built uh, or the components of the robot as built that the team had already produced and going back and, and drawing the CAD of those parts uh, and making a model uh, that looked reasonably much like the robot as, as passable, right? That's a key part of learning how to CAD. Uh, another step you can do is is uh, downloading and incorporating or uh, parts that other people have designed into your robot. Uh, so 
I, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, GrabCAD, Thingiverse, uh, uh, all those sorts of things um, where you can get free parts that other teams have uploaded. Uh, then uh, another thing is you can download CAD of parts from vendors. Like um, I know in a pinch, if there have been a lot of teams that had a part break on their robot and they didn't have a spare anymore, well, they can, they can download the CAD, they can 3D print it uh, and have a replacement part uh, right there waiting for them. It won't work probably as well because 3D printed parts generally don't work very well on a robot, but, uh, but in a pinch, uh, that can really be a lifesaver. And if you really know what you're doing, you can actually 3D print something that works. Uh, so I see a lot of teams that design and make accessories and aesthetic elements for their robot or for their team. Uh, jewelry, uh, I don't, it didn't look like a marker was actually part of the game this year. So, so uh, we had a couple of years of making markers, but that's over. Uh, so a lot of teams catted markers, uh, you know, covers for, for um, notebooks, covers for components on the robot, uh, logos for your team, trinkets in your boot, in your, um, uh, pit, uh, all those sorts of things. The, the numbers, I think, is on your robot are very accessible. Print yourself a neat uh, version of the team of the team number to go on the side of your robot. Um, and then finally, you like once you're once you've gotten pretty sophisticated, you start to actually design things that improve your robot's performance. Uh, you take uh, places where you have complex assemblies that are built out of multiple parts. Uh, those are going to shake loose over time, or or uh, bend, uh, and you want to replace them with things that, that capture multiple pieces or add a little more strength in a certain dimension, uh, you can start to design things that go on your robot. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, if you really want to go take the extra step, find projects in your, in your community that promote STEM uh, and, and incorporate them, uh, that promote STEM through PAD, uh, and, and uh, see if you can incorporated in your outreach. Uh, I, I won't say I have any brilliant ideas. If I had, I would have done them with the team, but I know that Eagle Robotics is doing things like this. Uh, and so, so maybe Grant can talk about that or not. Uh, I have a couple of pictures over at the right, I think that are neat projects, the neat projects I've encountered uh, through Thingiverse. Um, so at the top there is a, is a um, strain release for the USB cable for the the Rev Expansion Hub. It came from Team 2844. Uh, a few in the first year, the Expansion Hub came into existence. Like nobody should be running a, an Expansion Hub without that part on it to hold that cable in place. Uh, makes a, a tremendous difference in the connectivity of the and maintaining the connectivity of that part. Uh, the the one on the bottom is actually a local team, Rock and Robots FTC 5940. They they actually hosted uh, the local field this afternoon, I believe, uh, for the for uh, referee Lori's talk. Um, they, in the in the season where um, velocity vortex where the robots were chucking the balls up into the air and then they were falling down through the hoop, there was a, a serious rash of robots getting turned off because their switch was on the top of their robot. Uh, and they printed up this, this switch mount that was in all ways identical to the one you buy uh, from Tetrix, except it had those the little fin on the front and the back, and they even cut their team number into it. Uh, so when you downloaded it from Thingiverse uh, and, and printed it, you, you were driving around with a robot that had their team number on it. Uh, and they, they qualified for Worlds that year. When they got to Worlds, they encountered many, many teams that were using this on their robot. And, and basically teams across the country uh, knew their team because they had downloaded this part and printed it out. And it's an incredibly simple part. It, it probably took somebody uh, you know, just a few minutes to tab this up. So, so neat thing uh, done quickly. Um, go forward slide. Okay, so coming back to the notebook, uh, it is really, really critically uh, important that you document your CAD. Uh, I, I had seasons as a coach where basically half the notebook was CAD entries uh, because it is, it's pretty easy to to make these kind of drawings, like like appear over here on the right, right? These programs are, are fundamentally designed to to render these drawings and, and hand them off to a machinist to make the part. Uh, even if you're just learning and you're not actually making things that go on your robot, uh, learn how to make these drawings, 
print them out, put them in your notebook, uh, write notebook entries that explain why you designed this part, uh, uh, why you made the choices you made along the way, uh, what you learned uh, how to do, uh, and, and to do all that, uh, even if the part that you were working on wasn't anything you found useful in the end, even if at the end you were like, this is not, this is not for my robot, this, this is not useful, and, and you chuck it, uh, document it in your notebook. Uh, and assure you, uh, as an engineer and a scientist, uh, I have thousands of pages of notebook, and I have a whole lot of pages that are just like, end with, this was a really bad idea. <laughs> I'm never going to talk about this again. That page is still sitting there uh, years and years later, uh, and I can go find it if I want. If I ever think that idea is a good idea again, I can go find it and realize that it was not. Uh, okay, go ahead and advance. So I am not going to talk about this slide at all because the only piece of information that's actually worth mentioning on this slide is every single manufacturer you are thinking about buying parts from has all the CAD for everything that you're going to buy for them available to download. Uh, you can just go to their, their website. Uh, and some of them have like a sort of clearinghouse sort of thing where you click on one link and you download a file that has every single part that they sell. And others, it's on a page by page basis. So like Actobotics, when you look at a part on a page, there's that, there'll be a link down at the bottom that says download the step or it usually, um, most of them let you download the SolidWorks drawing. I'll, I'll ask Grant if that's true or not. Yeah, most of them are, most of them let you do that. And I'm actually gonna go ahead to the next slide and give an example of how you would do that. So like, yeah, let's yeah, say for example, uh, you wanted to download the file for this 135-degree uh, bracket from Rev Robotics. All you would have to do is scroll down a little bit to the uh, documentation and resources part. And as you can see, there's a CAD file right there, and all you do is click on the link. And this will be for most uh, websites that provide CAD, as Curtis just mentioned. So pretty much everything you just saw in the previous slide, all those websites will um, provide CAD. So. Then what you want to do is go into SolidWorks and click uh, open and then select your file that you just downloaded and you'll be able to insert the file right into SolidWorks. So that's something pretty neat you can do. And uh, Curtis mentioned also that his team was building an assembly of their whole robot. So if you wanted to do that, this is a great way to get all the uh, files you need. Instead of having to uh, model each file on your own, you can actually just download them from the websites. So here's an example. These two um, pieces of aluminum extrusion were also downloaded. So that's something cool. And this is just, you know, just showing how you can start assembling your robot. And another thing I wanted to mention is you can actually download the entire field uh, for each season from Andy Mark. So like this was last year's season, uh, Skystone. <clears throat> and as you can see, it's got everything on there and it's actually fully to scale. So even, so if you wanted to model your robot, you can put it onto the field that you downloaded and test it out and run simulations or whatever you wanted to do. Um, another cool thing that uh, our team did after modeling our whole robot, we thought it would be neat to do like renders. And um, Fusion 360 actually has great tools for rendering to create uh, like photorealistic uh, renders of your robot. So this is actually a model that we created in Inventor. And once we completed the whole assembly of our robot, we actually took it into Fusion 360 and created a render of it. So I thought that was a pretty uh, cool thing you can do in Fusion 360 that many of um, <clears throat> many other CAD softwares can't do. So here's another example of what we did, what we were able to do with Fusion 360 rendering. And this is something cool to add into your notebook, just along like along with the drawings, like Curtis said, you can add renders. Uh, of your full assembly of your robot. So I think Curtis and I've also have seen, that. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. I've seen teams do exploded drawings where they, they basically print on a, on a uh, very large piece of paper, uh, you know, feet by feet, uh, the exploded rendering of their robot. So every part separated out. I don't know if you've seen like drawings like that from manuals, but it's, Pretty wild way to look at a robot that's, that's got a, incorporated a lot of CAD components. Judges really liked that. 
Uh, okay, so we have a few slides on uh, ways you can make things that you design uh, from uh, it, most of this is, is hopefully stuff that the teams can, can find accessible uh, uh, and, uh, you know, some of it's a little more sophisticated. Um, Terry, go ahead, or Grant, go ahead. Um, why don't you talk about 3D printing for a while, if that's okay. All right, so our team actually used 3D printing a lot last season. It was actually one of the main components of our robot. Uh, 3D printing, the machines are inexpensive, but once you get to buying the materials, it can become relatively expensive. Like, I know for our team, like one spool of filament, like 800 grams, costed like over $100. But each spool will last you quite a while as long as you're not printing all the time. Uh, in industrial use, mainly they use it for prototyping. They're not going to really create any final products uh, using 3D printing mostly because it's slow and it's not, there's not a whole lot of precision with it. It, it can't get really super precise. Uh, there's not a whole lot of materials you can use really, like it, you can use plastics, metals, but it's often not as precise and as quick as other means of manufacturing. Uh, the, the parts are not uh, thermomechanically durable, meaning that they're not really gonna hold up under pressure or under a lot of heat or anything like that, so. <clears throat> yeah, there's a, and there's a lot of things you have to uh, look at when 3D printing. So, for example, as you can see on the top one, um, let's say you need to, so as you can see the triangles on the inside, that's actually, the whole part is not actually completely solid. So the, the infill is something you want to look at there. So a thicker infill will mean a more durable part, but it will also take longer to print. You also want to look at wall thicknesses, and so let's say for this part here, you'd probably want a thicker wall around that circle uh, in the middle uh, because obviously another part is going to be going in there, so you'd want to make sure that's durable. And you also want to look at uh, layer thickness, and layer thickness, um, a thinner layer thickness will provide a more durable part, but it will also take longer to print. So, and our team really uses 3D printing like primarily with our CAD last year for our robot. And I have, I mean, I have just some examples I can show later of that. Yep, so the thermomechanically stable part, I will I will say to, to all teams, I knew a team that left their robot in a car uh, in the sun, and actually the, the main material you print is called PLA. And PLA actually uh, has a, a, um, a transition around 120 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and so when they got their robot out of the car, it didn't work anymore. All the parts had kind of mushed a little bit. Uh, they, they hadn't melted, but they had moved enough that nothing fit right anymore. All right, go ahead. Okay, so uh, Grant, are you familiar with water jetting at all? Um, no, our team hasn't used water jetting before. Okay, so this is the machine you see it right there is actually the one on campus at Georgia Tech. Uh, so it is, a, it is a very large machine. It's about eight feet by eight feet. And, and the, the functional device is that tip right in the center with the, with the little plastic yellow cone over it uh, emits a jet of water uh, at extremely high speed. And the water has grit in it, uh, at various types of grit, depending on what you're trying to cut, um, but mostly garnet. And you just buy the grit by the, by the bag. Uh, and so the, there's a huge motor up top that can move this head around. And it can actually tilt it forward and back too. Uh, but, but a water jet is mainly used for cutting flat things. Uh, you, can, you can cut angles, but, but it's very complicated. Uh, it works for just about any material out there. So it can cut through inches and inches of metal and stone. And it's actually used quite a bit um, commercially for cutting countertops and quarrying, quarrying stone and, and things like that. So it can cut through just about anything. Uh, the, the because you are using these big uh, computer-driven motors, uh, it can locate features extremely precisely, uh, but the sizing of them is not precise because the, the, the jet of water has shape, uh, and it can actually walk off. So especially for thicker parts, as the, as the water cuts into the part, it can actually start to steer, and as it starts to steer into the metal, it actually compounds and steers more and more. So especially for anisotropic materials, uh, you can get this walk-off effect. Uh, these machines are, are very, very expensive, like hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, for these huge ones. Um, 
but but smaller ones are they, they call it a personal water jet they also have one of that that maybe only costs you know, tens of thousands of dollars instead uh, but once you own it uh, operating it and and sourcing the materials is not expensive uh, and and so this is really a workhorse for cutting um, metal parts uh, that can can be functional in your robot and there is a program through KSU and also through Georgia Tech that supports FIRST Robotics. Uh, I'm not sure for FTT those programs are particularly functional. I think they're much more useful for FRC teams, uh, and I think they're geared towards working in the spring, especially. Um, but I will say, if you have an alum from your program that is a Georgia Tech student, uh, that student, uh, at least in non-COVID times, that student can walk into this facility at any time and make a part you have designed. And so that's actually how my team used this facility. I was a Georgia Tech employee. Anything they catted, uh, I could go in and actually make on this water jet uh, whenever I wanted to and, uh, and hand it back to the team. Uh, so, so you might be surprised that you know somebody who can access a water jet. And there are companies that will also water jet your parts. Uh, there, there are a lot of machinists around who can water jet parts. They're not especially expensive. Uh, and they might be willing to cut you a deal if they know you're a first team. Uh, so, so I would not say uh, by any any stretch that, that this is inaccessible for teams. Um, my team actually printed uh, the the game where you had to latch onto the center center goal and pull yourself up. I forgot what that was called. Uh, my team printed a part uh, or water jetted a part out of titanium actually. That held that was a hook onto that because they kept bending. Uh, even three eighths thick aluminum kept bending, and so they cut a part out of titanium uh, on this water jet to uh, that worked really nicely. Suffice to say, it never bent. Uh, and this thing it doesn't slow down at all. It basically cuts titanium the same as aluminum. All right, next slide. Uh, CNC mill or router. Uh, Grant, again, I'll ask you. Do you have access to this sort of thing? Uh, we we have one, but we haven't used it yet. Uh, I took it home over the summer to learn how to use it, so I could talk a little bit about it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control, uh, and it's a router. Basically, it will take what you CAD in there, and it will drill out of a surface um, what you have put in the model for. It's usually for 2D um, sort of things. It's not really going to create 3D. Um, it's not really going to create 3D parts. It's more for 2D things. It can cut out of wood, out of plastic, aluminum, and <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't used it quite a lot, so I'm not really. That's pretty much the base of my knowledge on on the uh, CNC. Okay. Yeah, the machine you see there is basically a router that's mounted on a 3D printer frame. <laughs> Uh, and so it just reaches, so the, it, it just moves around the part and drills stuff out. Uh, you can get, again, ones that cost millions of dollars that are true three-dimensional machines. They basically have a chuck that holds the part and can rotate it to any angle underneath the drill bit. Uh, and the drill bit can also rotate to any angle. Uh, and these things can, uh, can cut incredibly precise uh, and incredibly complicated shapes out of piece of metal, obviously. Uh, that's not really going to be accessible to teams, but 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 these routers on a on a printer stand are actually uh, pretty accessible now. They definitely take some work to learn how to use them um, and a little bit of experience, and, and it's it's definitely an investment to get one. But I, I I know for a fact that there are some teams who are using this kind of uh, technology to to build parts for their robot. Uh, unlike the jet. Uh, you, you get very precise location and sizing, so you can actually cut through holes and things like that that you're going to tap uh, with this device. So go ahead and move forward one. Uh, and laser cutting and engraving is, uh, is um, again, so this is the machine that's at Georgia Tech, and um, it's a laser, so it's, it's basically a laser head that moves around above the part and turns on and cuts holes in material. Uh, so it basically is just cutting 2D. It can do relief also, but it's not very precise. Uh, but it prints on flat materials, and it can can also print on curved surfaces. Uh, like people can use it to like cut patterns into glasses and things like that. Uh, 
but it's a very, very limited material set, uh, basically just paper, wood, and acrylic. And that's because the wavelength of the, the laser uh, with other types of plastic uh, can actually create um, chemical reactions that make incredibly noxious chemicals. Uh, so in, in particular, um, PVC uh, produces gases that are actually deadly uh, to people. <laughs> And so you have to be very careful what you put into the machine. And a lot of things just melt also instead of actually cutting. Uh, so that's why you have this limited set. Uh, and, and for anybody who's tried it, you do not want to use acrylic in your robot. Acrylic has no impact strength at all. So the first thing that, it looks very pretty, but the first thing that bashes into it, you're gonna have a pile of acrylic shards on the ground. Uh, and, and especially when you weakened it by cutting lines into it with a laser. Uh, as I said earlier, it uses SVG files, and so this is much more uh, accessible for those who use Fusion 360. Uh, machines are pretty expensive. Operation is very, very cheap, um, and, it, and it does very precise cutting. Uh, you know, it, it takes some training to learn how to control the width and the depth of the cut, but these things work well. And again, um, this is one of these, or several of these actually at Georgia Tech, so if you knew a student at Tech, and then you can, there are also a lot of vendors who will laser cut things for you if you have designed them. Uh, so I think that's all I have to say about that one. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, this is something we've all done is trying to cut apart by hand. Uh, and that's just a long list of, of tools over there. But, but if you have a part which is particularly simple, which I will not say this one that I'm showing is, is that simple. Um, but if you have a part that's simple, it's just a square or, or, or you know, a shape with, uh, with convex edges uh, and some holes in it, uh, you just print out your part at one-to-one -one scale, tape it down to a piece of material, wood or metal or whatever, and uh, drill the holes and cut the lines where the lines are. Uh, this, I, I highlight this thing in the middle. This is a center punch, for those of you not familiar with it. It's a little spring-loaded thing in the center that you push it down until it pops. And uh, it makes a deep hole. Uh, and so the way that you get precise locations of all these holes is just take this thing down to your part and then take this thing and use it at the center of each one of the holes you're going to drill and you will get very precisely located holes in your part. Uh, and, and so you can CAD things that you're still going to make by hand uh, and get improved performance better than Better than the kind of guessing uh, that was pretty typical early on with my teams who had an edge, you know, a, a bench grinder and, <laughs> and just a thought about what they were trying to produce as opposed to something much more concrete like this. Uh, so I have a bunch of slides here on, on examples that, uh, that some teams have done over the years. I don't, uh, so go ahead and advance and let's see. Uh, okay. So yeah, go ahead and start talking here, Grant. Yeah, so this one, uh, this is what we used last year for our robot. It's lin these are linear slide spacers. So on the, on the picture of the left, the, the black and the blue and the white are actually 3D printed parts that we use to connect um, linear slides together. And as you can see on the picture on the, on the far right, you can see uh, them fully extended outwards. And so this was a really good tool last year for us to be able to lift uh, blocks up pretty high and place them down. We did have a little bit of trouble because they were 3D printed. They would end up uh, breaking under pressure. So the good thing that the good thing about them being 3D printed is we could print uh, backups to bring to meets and everything. So we only had that pro problem a couple of times, but they actually turned out working out. They worked really well for us last year. So it's something pretty pretty neat you can do with the 3D printer. Uh, yeah, so this this is a slide uh, from a, a team, Twisted Axles, who went to Worlds a bunch of time, and uh, they just uh, designed the part you can see in the lower right from scrap metal from from actually one of the previous fields, and uh, they did they like I, I think I highlight this because they did a lot of hand working, but then they also found a, uh, a local machine shop uh, that would drill the, the larger, uh, more precise holes uh, using their mill. Uh, and so this was a nice project all around in terms of uh, of them, you know, engaging with the community uh, and and getting a, a really lightweight uh, frame with a nice open interior in it. Uh, that's you know where they pulled in the, the uh, what do you call them, the glyphs from the game where you had to stack the big foam block called glyphs, uh, and uh, you know they 
they could easily modify this metal part after the fact. You know, they realize later on they're missing a hole. They just get out the drill and drill a hole where they need a hole. Uh, so, so yeah, that was a neat project for them. There, uh, there are you know some obvious other tatted parts like the sidewalls with the little honeycomb pattern in them too. Go ahead. Uh, so this is uh, the same same year, same game was my team. Uh, and you can see the prototype part over on the left is built out of, uh, this is the grabber arms for grabbing the stack of two glyphs. Uh, the prototype part over there is built out of uh, several separate pieces of metal uh, and lots of screws. Uh, and it was really, really flimsy and just bent all the time, right? And that mounted on the servos behind the, behind the frame there. Uh, had team designed a single part uh, that was water jetted out of aluminum that replaced everything that you see in that picture. And so we just had the two of them. We painted them lime green, which was our team color. And uh, they were mounted on the front of the robot and, uh, and they worked quite nicely. Uh, this, this is the sizing box uh, that my CAD team put together. Uh, so um, it's actually an 80-20 kit. So, so you can actually buy this thing if you uh, have this quote number. Uh, it's pretty heavy, but it is extremely precise. So We've been using this sizing box uh, at state championship and uh, other events, uh, and uh, it's you know clear on all sides. It's made out of uh, what's called 80/20 quick frame, uh, and and almost 100% of this was actually made uh, by hand. So just using a panel saw to cut the acrylic uh, and uh, bandsaw and, and uh, grinder to to precisely shape the, the metal pieces and fit them together. Uh, so even if you are making things entirely by hand, you can make some pretty sophisticated things uh, like this. Go ahead. Uh, team markers, obviously not a big thing this year, but a lot of teams came up with some really nice 3D printed team markers uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, that's, our, that's our two can at left. And then this is an example where where the, the CAD group uh, from from my team actually uploaded a part that they designed to Thingiverse. Uh, it's it's just this uh, really simple winch, um, but in order to be uh, really robust and be able to to withstand a lot of force, it's actually uh, hybridized with Actobotics hubs, and then the screws go all the way through it. So there's a hub on the back and a hub on the front. Uh, they, they designed it in three parts so that it prints on a flat surface, right? There's no overhang when you print it. You print the left disc and the right disc and then the center hub. It's got a little hole in there for tying off your string. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's in this picture, but I checked uh, a couple days ago. It had been downloaded by, it had been downloaded 383 times. Uh, and so I assume that some of those people probably printed it. It's pretty neat. Uh, all these years later, uh, you know, the kids still talk about uh, other teams using this part on their robot, uh, and that, that makes them pretty happy. So. All right, and there's, there's an example of just a, a uh, uh, rendering, uh, not nearly as pretty as, uh, as what Grant had put together, but that's a, that's a picture from uh, Inventor, I think they were using it at the time of, of a uh, of the completely drawn robot. So a lot of components on there were catted, like the team numbers uh, were catted and then cut. Uh, the little um, flappers way out at the edge actually were designed to have a sensor fit inside of them to protect the sensor and look out through a hole. Those are 3D printed. Uh, and there are a variety of other uh, water jetted parts on here, like the front plate uh, got water jetted. And a lot of things that were, were hand worked too, like all of all of the metal, it's all 80-20 uh, frame, and all of that was catted before it was cut and mounted on the robot. So. Uh, okay, I, th I think that's uh, the the whole presentation, so. Okay, cool. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if uh, people have any questions. Uh, looks like we have um, a little about 15 minutes still, so or we can wrap up early.
All right, well, I'm, I'm not seeing anything in Q of A, so maybe we're done. Okay. Yep. Okay, well, I guess uh, I guess we can call it a day. Uh, everybody get down to working on your robots. It's quite a uh, complicated game this year. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be fun. I don't even think I can remember half. I only watched the video once. I don't even think I can remember half of what uh, we've done this year. <laughs> All right. Well, Okay. everybody have a good season, and I hope to be seeing you out on the field by state uh, as, as rep or inspector or FTA or any of the other things that, uh, that I get to do with you guys. So have a good season. I will sign off.